thank you chairperson for kind introduction and thank you organizers particularly banshi bhai for inviting me on this topic uh, topic is uh, secondary diabetes and i think uh, my job is bit uh, lighter because dhruvi and just a previous uh, presenter dr ravi kant has managed to uh, unload few things for me so basically currently this is the classification of diabetes 2022 standard of medical care published by the ada uh, diabetes they classify now in type 1 diabetes type 2 diabetes gestational diabetes and specific types of the diabetes due to other causes so this number 3 specific types of diabetes due to other causes that we are discussing here that includes the monogenic diabetes as well as the other reasons for the secondary diabetes uh secondary diabetes term is now relatively obsolete but it was there in 2016 standard of care publication and these were the reasons for the secondary diabetes so uh, if you look at the important reasons for the secondary diabetes first thing is and other endocrine disorders like uh, say you can have a hyperthyroidism cushing's disease acromegaly these few chromocytomas all these can present with the diabetes also disease of exocrine pancreas can present with the diabetes miscellaneous autoimmune disorders like stiff person syndrome can present with the diabetes drugs and chemicals can present with the diabetes and rarely congenital infections like the rubella or coxsackie infections can present with the diabetes so but today i would be here discussing only about uh, disease of exocrine pancreas and drug induced diabetes because rest all topics are covered and endocrine disorders are, is a major thing uh, that has a big uh, lecture series on its own so coming to the diabetes due to the disease of exocrine pancreas any process that diffusely damage or substantially displaces the normal pancreatic tissue will ultimately lead to the development of the diabetes and if the individual is most predisposed to type 2 diabetic particularly if he is having obesity or insulin resistance even not a very significant damage to the pancreas can ultimately lead to the development of the diabetes these patients usually require insulin but insulin requirement is much less than the typical type 1 diabetics because here alpha cells are also destroyed so glucagon secretion is also impaired so there may be various causes inflammatory causes of the uh, exocrine pancreas that may lead to like acute pancreatitis chronic pancreatitis fibrocalculus pancreatic disorder diabetes and alcohol autoimmune pancreatitis infiltrations like hemochromatosis primary or secondary in india we more have a secondary hemochromatosis rarely sarcoidosis can present with the, uh, secondary diabetes uh, miscellaneous like the post surgical partial or complete pancreatectomy trauma or cystic fibrosis we will be discussing important one briefly coming to the acute pancreatitis uh, common metabolic abnormality associated with acute pancreatitis is hyperglycemia hypocalcemia hyperlipidemia and hypoalbuminemia uh, incidence of the glucose intolerance varies depending upon the severity uh, usually hyperglycemia is transient and use, uh, resolves within few weeks but 10% of the patients may have a severe hyperglycemia or even diabetic ketoacidosis these patients have usually have a very severe pancreatitis and degree of hyperglycemia within first 24 hours of the presentation is indicator of the severity of a pancreatic uh, pancreatitic pancreatitis and uh, overall outcome so if the blood glucose is more than 200 in first uh, 24 hours it indicates the worst prognosis permanent diabetes is there with the acute pancreatitis but sometimes it may be seen with the fulminant pancreatitis patient who has survived but in these patients again we need to assess, reassess the glycemic status 2 to 3 months and maybe regularly annually so that because they already have some damaged pancreas uh coming to the chronic pancreatitis incidence of the diabetes in chronic pancreatitis depends on the underlying etiology extent of the calcification that is very important and duration of the disease Uh, if the patient is having a calcific pancreatitis the picture dhruvi showed almost 50 to 70% of these patients have a diabetes non calcific chronic pancreatitis diabetes incidence is little bit lower around 
common complaints we know recurrent abdominal pain steatorrhea and weight loss so weight loss is here the important thing and major of the patient requires insulin but dose is typically low as we discussed and these patients again can have a very brittle control of diabetes they can have a recurrent episodes of the hypoglycemia again because of the destruction of the alpha cells pancreatic carcinoma is uh, one thing uh, which we should be considering in a middle age or elderly patient who is coming to you with the recent onset diabetes with decreased appetite and weight loss any diabetic he, who is presenting to you with the middle age or elderly with the decreased appetite weight loss please consider pancreatic carcinoma uh, usually these patients have a mild kind of a diabetes uh, we should be subjecting this patient to the ultrasound and further investigation if required pancreatic surgery obviously can ultimately lead to the development of the diabetes it depends upon the severity of the extent of the resection basically increased diabetic risk following the distal pancreatectomy because beta cells are more concentrated in the distal part of the pancreas so distal pancreatectomy often have an increased incidence of the development of the diabetes almost 70% uh, total pancreatectomy obviously will have a diabetes challenges are managing uh, diabetes in these patient because recurrent hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia is, uh, so basically these patients needs frequent small meals along with that multiple small doses of short acting insulins cystic fibrosis is uh, not very common in our uh, situation it's more of a west european problem uh, briefly discussing uh, basically there is a thick viscid secretion pancreatic secretion that causes the ductal obstruction and ultimately pancreatic destruction and pancreatic insufficiency uh, as that age progresses incidence of the di uh, diabetes increases from the 2 to 3% in the early childhood to almost 50% in the adults uh, but ketosis is rare in the cystic fibrosis related diabetes hemochromatosis is again a important thing hereditary hemochromatosis uh, is a mutation in the hfe gene located at chromosome 6 it's not a very common thing but uh, here we ha can have a secondary hemochromatosis patients with a thalassemia major who has a recurrent blood transfusions ultimately land up with the Uh, either an overload and they may develop hemochromatosis typical classical triad is cirrhosis diabetes and bronze skin so therapeutic approach to the pancreatic diabetes these patients definitely need a nutritional support because they are malnourished uh, liberal protein intake frequent small meals low neutral fat intake because uh, they have a fat intolerance high intake of complex carbohydrate alcohol should be absolutely avoided pancreatic enzyme supplementation definitely this patient need to avoid uh, malabsorption syndrome and multiple doses of the short acting insulin is usually preferred in these patients coming to second important group that is drug induced diabetes we exactly don't know how many percent of the people are suffering from the drug induced diabetes there are several drugs which can cause diabetes or worsen the glycemic control if the person is having a pre existing diabetes these diabetes may be very slow to develop and can be missed or it may be very abrupt and present with the uh, hyperglycemic emergencies now increasing use of atypical antipsychotics newer antipsychotics and there are newer anti cancerous drugs which are coming up and they can also cause diabetes or hyperglycemia we'll discuss briefly about them so th these are the various mechanisms by these drugs can cause hyperglycemia or diabetes it may be because of the insulin deficiency insulin resistance or combination of the insulin deficiency and insulin resistance uh, and uh, this newer drug alpelisib uh, that is a pi3k inhibitor used in the breast cancer it has a direct effect on the glucose metabolism we'll be discussing each one uh, important one briefly uh, checkpoint inhibitors are the very new anti cancerous drugs and they have changed the scenario of the management of the advanced malignancies now people with the advanced malignancy with, with the use of checkpoint inhibitors survive years uh, they are targeted therapy and drastically change the management usually used in the malignant melanoma lymphoma lung cancers and renal cancers uh, there are majorly three types of the checkpoint inhibitors i won't go into detail uh, 
but checkpoint inhibitors can cause autoimmune complications in 1 to 2 percent patients. It can cause autoimmune destruction of the pituitary, autoimmune destruction of the thyroid, autoimmune destruction of the adrenal, or autoimmune destruction of pancreas. Any of them can be occur. And once it occurs, it is process starts. It is usually irreversible. It doesn't respond to steroids. Uh, so this is very uncommon side effect, but very important side effect because it's almost permanent uh, insulin deficient diabetes. Uh, usually these patients present with the acute hyperglycemia. 50% uh, of these patients may have a islet autoantibodies. And usually these patients also have a HLA-DR4 allele which predisposes to the type 1 diabetes. So any person who is predisposed to the type 1 diabetes are more likely to develop diabetes when he is on the checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, Anti-cancer drug like alpacilib, this is the, another newer drug, this is the PI3K inhibitor used in the metastatic breast cancer. Again, its most common side effect is hyperglycemia. More than 60% of the patient uh, 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 hyperglycemia is observed and more than 60% and usually typically seen after two cycles of the therapy. But good thing is it has a short half-life and it has a effect, uh, direct effect on the metabolism of the glucose only. So once we stop this drug, this hyperglycemia is resolved. Uh, the direct effect includes the reduction in the glucose synthesis as well as the preference for the fatty acids for the cells. Uh, glucose is spared, that's why there is a hyperglycemia. Uh, commonly used immunosuppressants like the calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin, cyrolimus and tacrolimus. These can also cause diabetes. Uh, it is called as post-transplant diabetes. And risk factor is old age, non-white ethnicity, HCV positive patient. And sometimes usually these patients are also on the steroids. So that also is a risk factor. And the main mechanism is by inhibition of the islet beta cell expansion. Uh, though it have a, cyrolimus have a uh, inhibition of the mTOR pathway also. One important thing to note here is that Hyperglycemia effect of the serolimus is significantly less than the tacrolimus. So if the patient is on the tacrolimus and developing hyperglycemia, you can try the serolimus and see if the, it is managed or not. Uh, newer immunosuppressant IL-2 monoclonal antibody, that is Mbasiliximab. Again, it is used in the patient, patients with organ transplant for the rejection. IL-2 plays a very important role in the maintenance of the immunologic self tolerance and problem with this pathway can lead to the autoimmune diabetes like a type 1 diabetes. Uh, almost 40% of the patients who receive basiliximab may develop hyperglycemia or post-transplant diabetes. Corticosteroid, as we all know, is an immunosuppressant as well as an anti-inflammatory and chemotherapeutic agent. It has been widely used and widely abused also and we are seeing in the COVID era uh, effect of the corticosteroids on the glycemic control. It has been very widely discussed. I won't go into detail. But if the person is on the long-term corticosteroid, risk of new onset diabetes is almost twofold. Uh, it depends basically on the dose, duration, and route of administration. Older history, other risk factor for development of diabetes is an increased risk factor for development of the diabetes here. And corticosteroids mainly increases the postprandial glucose. Various mechanisms include the increasing insulin resistance, increased hepatogluconeogenesis, and reduction in the beta cell function also. And apart from that, we all know steroids can increase the appetite and cause weight gain. So that further fuels the insulin resistance. Coming to the antipsychotics, it is a very important thing. And in, in fact, in 2003, there was consensus statement by the ADA, American Psych Psychiatric Association, and AS that said that the antipsychotic increases the risk of diabetes and dyslipidemia with the risk of metabolic abnormality closely aligned to the degree of weight gain. Because weight gain is a very common problem with these drugs, and prevalence of the di diabetes is two to three times higher in the patient who is taking antipsychotics than the general population. And people with uh, uh, severe mental illness and on, and on antipsychotics are very much ha at high risk of developing the hyperglycemic emergencies. So these are the first generation antipsychotics and the second generation antipsychotics. Among the first generation, chlorpromazine uh, nowadays is not very commonly used but has a maximum risk. Uh, 
and among the second generation antipsychotics, clozapine and olanzapine both increase the risk of weight gain, insulin resistance and risk of development of the diabetes. Antidepressant again is an important risk factor. In fact, depression and diabetes is uh, very closely related and uh, it's a issue, major issue nowadays. Uh, various antidepressants can cause a weight gain but tricyclic antidepressant is notorious for that. Uh, that weight gain can ultimately lead to the increased insulin resistance. And uh, many times we are using uh, tricyclic antidepressant in combination with the pregabalin for treating the peripheral neuropathy in these patients. So that is the one thing. And in an, even in animal studies, it has been shown that tricyclic antidepressant can reduce the insulin release also, apart from increasing the insulin resistance. Anti-epileptic valproic acid, again it's a broad spectrum anti-epileptic, uh, but it has a metabolic effect. It can cause fatty liver, it can cause significant weight gain, dyslipidemia and hyperglycemia. Almost 40% of the people who are on the long-term valproate ultimately develop impaired glucose tolerance. Recombinant growth hormone, uh, people who are short stature with growth hormone deficiency, when growth hormone is given, there is a, again a significant risk of development of diabetes in these children who are treated with the recombinant growth hormone. Statins, it has been widely discussed and debated, uh, but it is an important risk factor for development of diabetes. Uh, uh, in the DPP pre, uh, program, risk was uh, estimated to the tune of 30%. And it, risk depends on the intensity of the statin therapy. Uh, and its mechanism is basically a multifactorial, probably increasing the insulin resistance and decreasing the insulin secretion by impairing the beta cell function. Antiprotozoal pentamidine can cause, a, uh, it's uh, basically used in the pneumocystis infection and leishmaniasis. It ca can cause the direct destruction of the beta cells. In early stage, it, it will cause the hypoglycemia because of the massive release of insulin from the beta cells. But ultimately, it will lead to the diabetes or hyperglycemia. Antiretroviral drugs, particularly protease inhibitors, ritonavir, nelfinavir and in, uh, indinavir. Here almost 10% of these patients may develop uh, diabetes over a long period of time because the risk factor is probably increased insulin resistance and effect on the GLUT4 re receptor activity. Uh, coming to important group of drug, antihypertensive, particularly beta blockers. First generation and second generation beta blockers can cause impaired glucose tolerance or frank diabetes, part particularly propranolol, etanolol or metoprolol. Third generation, uh, carvedilol, nebivolol, or bisoprolol are not associated with this, these side effects. Uh, uh, Meta-analysis showed almost 22% increased risk of new onset diabetes, person who is taking long-term beta blockers, or this first or second generation beta blockers. And probably, probable mechanism is uh, impaired uh, first phase insulin release, increased insulin resistance because of the weight gain. Uh, another anti-hypertensive that is thiazide, long-term use of thiazide, thiazide is associated with hyperglycemia again. Uh, important thing is it down regulates the PPR gamma receptor. PPR gamma receptor is the same uh, on which the pioglitazone act. So it has an opposite effect of the pioglitazone. So take home message here is uh, currently when the polypharmacy is almost a norm rather than an exception, we are using multiple drugs in these patients. Uh, we should be aware about the diabetogenic potential of these drugs. And if uh, these patients are on the diabetogenic drugs, we should be screening them regularly for development of the hyperglycemia. And uh, if uh, hyperglycemia is detected and if culprit drug is stopped early, like the C uh, calcineurin inhibitors or PI3K inhibitors or thiazides or beta blockers, uh, probably diabetes can be reversed. And similarly, uh, patient who mal who malnourished patient who is coming to you with a diabetes always suspect the pancreatic diabetes. Thank you.